So this session is discovering New York City open data. And uh, we've been doing some introductions, that's cool. Uh, one question I have is how many of you have used New York City open data before or other data, uh, open data? Do you have a favorite data set? Just drop that in the chat uh, and uh, Dimitri can share those. One of my favorite data sets, well, actually most recently I was looking at st some stuff from the uh, uh, Department of Homeless Services. I was curious about uh, the change in un unsheltered population over time, and there were some good data sets that I found through the portal. But yeah, I'll, I do a lot of stuff with census data sets. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see the three one one requests today. That's gonna be our main demo, at least. It is overwhelming. Uh, yeah, tree tree related data. I used to work at Google. It was doing public statistics or questions like uh, what's the population of France or uh, uh, unemployment in California and things like that. But uh, they, the reason I mentioned them is on the ninth floor, there was a art installation based on uh, one of the tree censuses. Uh, I forget quite how it worked, but it was a physical visualization. So they had these like little clear uh, trans transparent uh, plastic representations of, I don't know, tree height or count or something like that uh, along one of the walls in the long hallway. Anyway. <laughs> um, late tech adopter. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, that's... I once had a set of uh, open data ambassador session in Queens where uh, the population of the audience, the audience demographics, they went from about a 15-year-old to like a 65-year-old, several... Uh, it was yeah, it was great. I lo I love how it's a topic that can be interesting to so many different people for so many different uh, reasons. Uh, and I think one of the important ones is the fact that you can see, like it's it's an administration's view of some facet of the city related to their mission, right? So if you want uh, some improvement or change in your community, you can quantify it in a way that's legible or meaningful to an agency uh, and like we'll see examples where I uh, filter down to the community district and that's the sort of information stats change in stats in a community district is exactly the sort of thing you could bring up in a community board so uh, today we're going to be uh, we've done the welcome and some of the intro. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about New York City open data and how it fits into like the history of good governance and transparency. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our open data portal uh, and how to navigate that and then go through uh, a couple of exercises filtering and visualizing facets of the 311 service request data set. Uh, then we're going to take a look at a couple of uh, interesting, I think, tools that uh, use open data. Uh, and then uh, it's over to you. It's, uh, what's important to you, questions you have, things you want to see, uh, along with a couple of uh, final housekeeping info on how you can stay involved with the uh, open data uh, community. So yes, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for coming to this session. And I hope that uh, you take away some like sense of better understanding of what open data is, why it's important, and how you can use New York City open data. This program and curriculum were created by the New York City Office of uh, Data Analytics, the OTI. Uh, that was all, all the computing agencies were consolidated in the current administration. So that uh, it used to be Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, and I think, uh, but, uh, and uh, Beta NYC, which is uh, just a fantastic resource. They're a, uh, a nonprofit here in town that uh, really has become a crucial hub of the uh, civic technology community. Uh, that's where Dimitri is from, by the way. <laughs> So we're going to go through a really quick uh, look at New York City's open data law and where it came from. 
So the first question, what, does anyone want to take a uh, stab at defining what open data is? What does it mean to you? Oh, you don't need a question mark. <laughs> I'm just asking for your, like, like where, where you're at, what you're thinking is. Yeah. Now, all of these get at important different facets of it. Uh, public availability is one of the big ones. The openness here is like, I guess, transparency and availability. Uh, yeah, great responses. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, one of the things in our open data law is that it's not narrative. They're factual and statistical information. Uh, they uh, refer to lists, tables, graphs, charts, as opposed to uh, verbal descriptions. Uh, it's alphanumeric and like, digital. Uh, it's not an image, although that gets a little fuzzy when we get into stuff like geospatial data, uh, stuff that's like in a GIS system uh, is covered by the law but uh, it, because it's like statistical factual information associated with them, uh, but it doesn't include things like scans of maps, uh, blueprints, stuff like that. Uh, although, again, the law, law is careful not to prohibit that. Agencies are free to include other kinds of digital information. Uh, uh, the data is something that they produce or maintain, agencies produce or maintain uh, pursuant to their missions. So like th these are the f facets that make it city open data. So it's from the city, it's open and a default open as in like they have to produce, produce it unless there's a reason they uh, can or may not. Uh, so what I mentioned earlier that it's kind of like a slice of the, of city life that is related to some agency's mission. So here we see kind of uh, little labels corresponding to departments and some fact about Union Square that they care about. Uh, for example, with the recycling bin, it's the fact that it's uh, an outdoor versus indoor bin, that it's at the specific latitude, longitude, and the department that own it are all like facts about it that are important. Uh, similarly for transportation, street quality, for uh, health and mental hygiene, there's restaurant inspections, which is, by the way, a really fun data set, <laughs> uh, and so on and so on. Uh, everything from taxi medallions to uh, uh, building codes and zoning and so on. Uh, and a lot of these, uh, well, like one really fun tool is New York City map, which unfortunately I was going to show you, but it's down uh, because it's being refreshed for Open Data Week, and it, it's going to be so much better. But unfortunately, I won't be able to show that to you today. Um, it's a lot of there's a lot of information, a lot of different kinds of information, and it can be like someone mentioned in the chat, a little overwhelming. Uh, there's a long history. It's not just since computers that we can talk about open data. Uh, things like procurement, things like hiring and job postings are useful for the public to know. Like after Tammany Hall and the golden age of corruption, uh, there were some progressive reforms like the publication of the city record, which you can actually still see today online. Uh, and there's a project at, I think, NYU Tandon where they uh, have scans of historical city record publications. And it was seen as a tool of oversight. Uh, by making all this information about how the city is operating publicly or available, uh, the public had the opportunity to see what was going on, to get a better confidence and trust in, that the government was working fairly. Uh, the, uh, the the that was kind of the, the, it was a big step forward and skipping forward a few decades uh, there was another big step step forward when the federal government and states began passing freedom freedom of information laws like the federal FOIA or New York State FOIA uh, so that started in the late sixties early seventies and. Uh, 
you can see here that this is some pretty fascinating stuff. Uh, like this was, uh, the FBI was required to make available the uh, reports on their investigations of civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. here. Uh, what's notable about these freedom of information laws is while they're required to produce information that they aren't prohibited to produce, you have to ask for it and you have to know what you're asking for. They're not required to do research for you uh, and they don't have to tell you what information they have. That is one of the really tricky things about freedom of information laws. Uh, it's a powerful tool for researchers and investigative journalists and good government groups, but finding a toehold, finding a document that points to other documents and so forth can be a little tricky. For New York City government, we actually began publishing a data directory where each the data sets owned by agencies were listed in a uh, booklet uh, and the data sets they, that were available for freedom of information requests were described and you could get them in electronic diskette or uh, tape or printed form. Uh, many of the databases described in here, uh, I think like Pluto, although that was just recently upgraded, uh, are even, even still exist today because a lot of the administrative systems, administrative tasks have continuity with, with even like the early 90s or longer ago. Uh, the, the big shift in the uh, 2000s and 2010s was towards default open. If you have a data set, you have to make it public. And in here in New York City, our open data law uh, was published or uh, enacted in 2012 and amended a few more times since then. For example, the First Amendment of it uh, uh, required like describing what was in the data with a data dictionary, which we're going to take a look at later. Uh, uh, and there are two things that are important here. Our open data law required uh, all the uh, data sets to be indexed and made available on a open data portal, uh, like one place for people to look for data. And it, uh, and I just completely forgot the second thing I was going to say. No, I remember now. It was a, because it's actually legislation rather than something like an executive order, it's not subject to the preferences of an administration. It won't be like going on for eight or 12 years and then gone for another eight or 12 years. Uh, they're, they're required to adhere to it with continuity. So that portal, New York City Open Data, has over a million visitors a, uh, a year, thousands, around 3,000 more actually data sets. And it takes full-time work to find what data is uh, required to be put on the portal, to get it cleaned up into a form that can be put on the portal, to document it, and to keep all that up over time. Uh, and the people responsible for that at the agencies are open data coordinators. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're going to start looking at the portal and I'm actually going to do that live uh, in a demo. So I hope it, it works. <laughs> uh, if you go to the website here, newyorkcity.gov slash open data or slash data, I, I'm lazy, so I don't like to type as much. Uh, it'll take you to a page that looks just like this. You can click here to search or you can browse by going to the data link. And that, whoops data link <laughs> is here. Uh, this, this page, actually. You can view data sets that are brand new, that are recently updated, that are re popularly used. You can see how they are organized by category of like topical category or by who produces them. Like I said before, recently I was looking at Department of Homeless Services. Uh, I didn't know what data set I was looking for, so I actually used this page to just look at all of their data sets. Yeah, going back to the main page, 
This was all supposed to be preloaded. My computer just crashed right before this. Uh, let's start taking a look at the 311 service request data set. I think to answer David's question, we they are they're getting a lot better. Uh, New York City has been doing it longer, and I think our coverage is a little better. And Los Angeles is quite good. I'm not as familiar with Chicago or Boston. Uh, so yeah, I had uh, done it, just uh, done a search for the key text 311, and you can see that there's a few different uh, hits. The one we want is actually the first one, but you can see that there are two data sets or two responses with that uh, title. Do you, does anyone have an idea of how we might know which one to use? Yeah, I think it's my recollection, David, that New York City was one of the earlier cities to get on the open data uh, bandwagon, I guess, or just like an early adopter leader, uh, which is your terminology. Uh, but I, I find our data is generally very timely. There's good infrastructure to support it. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you get. Yeah. Good, good observation, JQ. Uh, and that difference is a data lens is kind of like a dashboard. It's where someone has taken a data set and made charts and tables, uh, subsetting it so that you, you have some view of it. Uh, but yes, this one is the actual data set and that's what we're gonna look at next. So what jumps out at you here? What are some questions you might answer uh, about this data set? One of them, is this the data set I'm actually looking for? Like I said, I wanted to see 311 service requests. We see that this title says it's service requests. Yep, how big, how current, great stuff. So this is, and, and if we expand the description, which I highly recommend you always do, we can see that it's updated daily. Uh, that's also in the metadata elsewhere, like update frequency daily. Uh, metadata, data about data. Uh, this is, well, I'm not sure if it's changed. Dimitri, can you correct me if I'm wrong? But it used to be uh, Socrata. Uh, I yeah. might say at the bottom, actually. Eh, it doesn't say at the bottom. <laughs> yes, I believe it is run on Socrata. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's some new functionality that uh, I haven't, kept up with and I wasn't sure if that marked a change of vendors or maybe Socrata got purchased or something like that. Ah, great question, Tom. It's like, is this the data we're looking for? Well, what's a service request? Uh, in this case, one, we're gonna actually see something that might answer that for us. Uh, but first let's take a look at some of the other facets. Like someone asked how current, well, this was updated yesterday. Uh, and we see that, like that thing said, it's updated daily and automatically. Uh, and it's been made public like 13 years, 12 years ago, 12 and a half years ago. A um, lot of people view it, a lot of people download data from it, and it's big. It is 32 and a half million rows. Is this something that you think you could analyze on your computer easily? Maybe in Excel? No, Excel maxes out around a, a million rows. It used to be 65,000. Ah, Tyler, thank you, David. Uh, cool, cool. It sure is. Uh, yeah, Excel is great, but uh, you can also tie Excel to a database. There's a number of different ways to go. Put downloading the data because it'll come to you in a tabular form, 41 columns, 32 million rows. You can put it in a database or you can it, it's big for some tools, but it's not big for others. You could load it in a Python program on most desktops today, for example, uh, and analyze it without problems. So depends on the tool is the answer. Uh, what are those uh, col or columns and what is a service request? A really, really important document on this page is the data dictionary. I mentioned that before, uh, that an amendment to the open data law required data dictionaries. Uh, let's 
take a look at that. I downloaded it and put it into Google Sheets, so it'd be easy to show here. Uh, data set description might tell us what a 311 service request is. Uh, it doesn't quite say that, but I, I can I can describe it a little bit. Uh, it's not strictly calls because there are other ways you can contact 311, such as the app. And it includes any time that someone is asking for help using 311. Uh, although, yeah, they mentioned the uh, COVID difficulties. Uh, th there are some really fascinating uh, ones of those that show up in the data if you look for them, uh, such as difficulties with sanitation pickups. So you see a spike of sanitation uh, service requests slash complaints. Those are used interchangeably. Uh, yes, that's that's correct. Uh, in this case, the columns don't tend to be huge. A description has uh, some limited length, which, by the way, this data dictionary was updated yesterday, and it's so much better now. It gives a lot more description of what those 41 columns are. Uh, and what kind of data lives in them. For example, a really important one is the created date. Uh, if the ticket has been closed by the time this data set is updated, it'll have a closed date. Uh, if not, it won't. Uh, that uh, status is represented in this column. Uh, category information, like what exactly the complaint is about, lives in complaint type and descriptor. Uh, those are documented in these subsequent tabs, by the way, uh, and we're going to take a quick look at those. Um, if it was resolved, the resolution is described. If it's associated with a place, uh, that place is described. Uh, later on, I'm going to filter by community board. Uh, I mentioned Pluto earlier. BBL is, uh, oh, I've forgotten what it stands for, but it, it's an administrative identifier for lots. Uh, This is kind of fun for complaints related to uh, livery or uh, taxi limousine commission. Uh, it includes some kind of interesting information about the uh, taxi itself. So one that I didn't touch on yet is unique key. And it's important to note that while each row in this data set has a different unique key, hence the name, it's not the same as the request identifier that you get when you actually make the request. <laughs> Thank you, Dimitri. Yes, that's a really important concept for very specific purposes, uh, BBLs are. Um, what's, these get particularly interesting when you are aggregating. Let's say I filter for requests for the housing department. I want to count how many there are. The thing I want to count is distinct unique keys. If I want to know how many days there were complaints to them, I would count distinct, say, creation dates, uh, and so on. Uh, just, to, just to recap with this, uh, look, looking at the uh, summary page and the data dictionary, there's some key questions you want to ask. Is this actually the data I need? Will this an answer my question? And the title, the description, the metadata, does it cover the time period I'm interested in is a big one. Uh, for example, with the Department of Homelessness Services statistics, it was difficult to find ones that covered the whole time range I needed. I need to, to get several of them and stitch them together. Yes. Thank, thank you, Tom. Yeah. Uh, Dimitri, do you have a thought on what a good way to handle that difficulty is? There's a lot of coded language, Tom says in the chat, uh, BBL, service request, these are all jargon. Uh, one thing I think could work could be to join the Beta NYC Slack and ask people who are interested in civic technology. Uh, it, there's a really good community there. But you're you're right that when you are trying to find the data set that will answer your question, it can be tricky. Uh, and it, it just, it takes practice. It gets easier the more you do it. Oops. So yeah, I mentioned, does it cover the time period I'm interested in? So for uh, the 311 data, we saw it was updated yesterday. Ah, sorry, uh, Beta NYC 
is a civic technology nonprofit. Uh, Dimitri is uh, uh, works for them. Link different humans. You know, I know I would do that using a programming language or a database. Uh, I'm not sure if the portal lets you do that. I think the closest it comes is map layers and map visualization. I believe those can come from just different data sets. Uh, but otherwise, I don't think it gives you join capabilities. You have to download the data if you want to do that. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, uh, can, can you share the link to that, uh, Dimitri? It'll also be among the links that I share at the end for resources. Yes, yes. Um, towards the end, we'll share all of the links for joining and seeing in touch with Beta NYC. And we'll also have um, some options for you guys to reach out to if you need some explanations or some information. Yeah, okay, so David uh, was asking about, are there identifiers that are shared between the 311 data set and other data sets? Well, I mean, kind of. The BBL is a shared identifier across many agencies and data sets. Uh, the agency codes, the acronyms for the agencies are common. Uh, I think most of the others, just, just going by memory, are specific to the kind of data being described here. Uh, time frames, you can join on time frame, even though that's kind of risk, like not 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 precise, let me say, not risky. Uh, but there are, where, where it's straightforward, I think there may be identifiers supporting that. Uh, BBL being a good example. Uh, like that way, if you're interested in heating violations or complaints, uh, and you want to cross-reference those with heating uh, enforcement, for example, you might be able to do that. Um, yeah. So yeah, the size, we talked a little bit about that, what an appropriate tool is. Uh, if you are going to use something like Excel, then there's powerful filtering capabilities that you can use on the portal before you download the data, which is gonna be what we look at next. Here we go. Uh, yeah, so when you actually click on the view data link here, it'll take you to this page. Uh, you can see the first, I guess, 100, yeah, 100 your own and service requests. Uh, yeah, this bottom number is kind of gives you some of the scale. It shows you like what you're actually looking at. So just as a quick engagement check, uh, how big is this data set? How many requests does it cover? And what's the time frame it covers? Actually, uh, Viola, Viviola mentions, uh, yep, well, mm, close, there you go. <laughs> One order of magnitude there. Uh, yep. And that's from this, uh, this right here. So, if we wanted to ask a specific question, like if I'm interested in my neighborhood, I live in Hell's Kitchen, I live, in, it's part of uh, Manhattan Community District 4. Uh, suppose I want to ask how many or what were the complaints there this year since the start of the year? And the way I'd start to do that is I'd add filter. First, to get the data small, I'd filter by uh, by when it was created. I want to look at the records for this year. We can see that there are 32 and a half million right now. What would it look like when I add that filter? And let's see, we can see that it's actually updating the row count. And we can see that, well, that didn't change because it's sort of uh, decreasing, but sort of increasing. Mm, that's not right. Oh, 1023. <laughs> uh, let's try that again. Yeah, I, the, all of our requests have happened after uh, 102380. <laughs> That's looking more promising. We can see that uh, when we, oh yes, you can click on these headers just like in a lot of interactive tables to sort by them. Uh, this is reflected in the sort and roll up column. Uh, which I'm 
we'll talk about briefly before, but the, I think it will probably be a little too slow to demo. So I'm going to cheat and tell you because the, the, the portal can be a little slow. There's there's a lot of people using it and it's shared resources and things like that. So just be, be patient. The data is there. You'll get an answer. It may just take a few minutes. Uh, however, since I am impatient, uh, I'm going to add my next filter too. Uh, and that filter is adding the community board. Now, there's a lot of different ways to spell that. So what I'm actually going to do is see what it looks like in this data set. And we can see that it is a zero prefixed two digit uh, a community board number, followed by the borough name in all caps. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to, I live in uh, community district four, so I'm going to put zero four Manhattan. Okay, and we can see that. And now, oh, look, now it actually was able to show us the number. This has gone down to 8,440 requests. That's how many uh, 311 service requests have happened in my community district uh, since uh, the beginning of the year. Uh, okay. Hmm. There are generally, I think we tend to see those. Uh, Kathleen asks in the chat: Were handwritten records from the 1800s, for instance, uh, for for housing and, or buildings transferred to the database? And I don't think they are in city databases. Uh, other, like for example, the city record, I mentioned that the paper copies are maintained in scanned form by NYU's engineering school, for example. Uh, there are a lot of these records available, not all of them from uh, city databases. Uh, that said, if they're in city databases, there's, uh, with some exceptions, uh, an open data data set reflecting. So I'm going to try to do a roll up. The question I want to ask is, what were the most frequent complaint types oops, in my community district this year? Uh, and the way you do that is in the sort and roll ups, this is like a pivot table if you're using a uh, spreadsheet. I want to see what the complaint types were rolling up by. And I said that if you count the unique keys, that will give you a proxy for the number of service requests. Um, and then we want to, I guess we'd sort by, I think this will work because the count of unique keys, we want to see what the most popular are. So we'll go to sending. Let me try applying that. It's possible that this will happen quickly. And it did. Okay. So um, in the first quarter of 2020, it looks like the most frequent complaint of first two months uh, and a half were illegal parking followed by heat and hot water. That's actually not too surprising given that this is winter. It might be interesting to see what's number one, number two in summer. So I'm actually going to do that is between, oops, let me make that, oops, yes. Uh, I want to see what's between oops, and 2022. So just basically uh, the third quarter. Okay. Now that's quite different. You can see heat, hot water has fallen way off. Uh, heat, because heat is like a crucial element of living in uh, winter, but people living outdoors is again easier in winter so you may see more of that uh illegal parking is still right up there yeah sergio asks uh this data set is released as is multiple years and made it available as a historical data set uh, i'm not quite sure i understand can you rephrase that question sergio this data set contains requests from 2010 through the day before, or to, through yesterday, basically, uh, on any given day. It's uh, continuously updated. So if a, like if I open a request today and it's resolved tomorrow, 
in two days, it'll show up as resolved. Tomorrow, it'll show up as open. So the historical data is continuously present. For example, I am filtering for these time periods uh, in the recent past, but I could do this for any period through, uh, like, all the way back to 2010. <laughs> yes, they did. I'm not sure if we're seeing more helicopter noise uh, or if there's more awareness of it because of the legislation proposing banning helicopter flights. I don't actually know. That's uh, one, one thing you'll often find with open data is that uh, it is a fertile ground not just for answering questions, but for coming up with questions. So I'm actually really happy that these uh, roll-ups were so quick. Uh, oh, that's a good point. It could just be that we've added the category recently. Again, I don't know. That's There's a really amazing book called Sorting Things Out by uh, Jeff Bowker and Susan Lee Starr. And it's about the history of like categorization schemes and it looks at a few case studies like the icd codes for uh uh like illness and disease classification and things like that and how they change over time and what that reflects about the priorities of the people who are maintaining them it's a great book it's very academic though very dry prose but uh the topic is fantastic uh so right now what we're seeing here is a table uh but this is actually information that would be well presented visually. And to do that, we can use the visualization tool, uh, maybe to decide if we want to download it, a data set or something like that. And once we click on that, it takes us to this page, which uh, that's actually something you could figure out, by the way, going back to the is helicopter noise a recently added category by, by uh, filtering for that category and seeing when the earliest record is. So in addition to posing questions, it can tell you when to start looking for, for example, uh, narrative records, documents uh, in maybe city council meetings about that topic. So uh, this has two key facets here, dimension and a measure. A measure is a thing that varies. Usually it's continuous, but it can be something like a count. Uh, and dimension is a way of breaking down your data. Uh, for example, things that are categorical, uh, such as the complaint type, like I was just looking at. Uh, like I said, a measure can be uh, something that varies. This has kind of a strange set of them. Count of roses, whoops, sorry. Count of roses is what we'll stick with here. Um, right now, you can see this I'm busy spinner because I didn't put in any filters. Uh, I'm just going to put in the same create a date filter I had in the other uh, table. There was one, one, oops. 23 through 311. It, this, even though I'm putting 311 in here, it actually only will include data through the 10th because that was when the data set was updated. As you can see here, it gives you a little summary. Uh, unfortunately, because I didn't do that, First, it's going to try to sum, sum everything up and show you the uh, data over 32 million rows. Let me actually just reload it. Oh, there it goes. And then I reloaded it. <laughs> uh, computers. All right. Okay. And I just did the same thing again, didn't I? Okay. I'll, I'll be a bit more patient this time. I just saw a question appear in the chat. Ah, yes. Actually, uh, this is something I uh, don't know if you saw when I was showing the metadata, but one of the fields is whether it's uh, automatically updated and the update frequency. Some data sets, like with building data, it doesn't actually make sense to update them every day. So uh, you might see those uh, getting updated monthly or quarterly, or in some cases, not at all. The open data law did say that uh, they included data created or maintained uh, by or on behalf of an agency that records measurements, transactions, or other determinations related to their mission. 
So if these are things that are constantly changing or being made over and over, for example, restaurant inspections, it makes sense for those to get updated regularly. Uh, other, other things like geospatial information about uh, lots, that changes very infrequently. So you may see that, uh, uh, yeah, you may see that not getting updated for years, if at all. I've seen data sets like, or reports, for example, if I give uh, the equivalent of a spreadsheet, a lot of those Department of Homeless Services uh, requests give you statistics for one year. And it doesn't make sense for that to get updated year on year. They'll publish separate ones, or they do. I would not mind if they published an enlarging data set, but that's not, not how they chose to do it. Um, yeah, so, uh, Remember how many rows this was? Yeah, 540,000. That's much better than 3 million. But this is really hard to read, right? I can still see that, especially if I mouse over, that uh, parking heat, hot water at the top. Uh, but I can't read them on the chart. And there's way too many uh, bars. There's some tools here to let you limit that. Under column display options, you can limit it. and. Right now, this is showing you the top 10. I happen to think the top 15 looks better. Uh, and it'll update that in a second. But an important option is what you do with the ones you're not showing. Hello, Alex. And sometimes, depending on what you want to config, if you want to give a complete view of the data set, it can be useful to include the other column, the things that are not included in the shown categories. Uh, if you are only interested in the top 10 complaints, like in my the query I was saying, these are the top 10 complaints in all of New York. And I was interested in the ones from my community district. So we go down from that 540,000 to, uh, I think it was 8,000 in a minute. There it goes, 8440. Um, the, the question you're answering changes depend or uh, changes depending on the filter, but it also dep changes depending on the kind of visualization you're making. Uh, for example, I happen to like uh, horizontal bar charts a bit more than vertical ones, just because you can be more compact while still making things easy to compare. Visually, I find it easier to look up and down than sideways for uh, seeing differences, except for like time series charts and things like that, for example. Uh, this is an inappropriate chart for this dimension, by the way. Uh, here we might do something like create a date instead and get a better visualization. So we can see that this seems to be lumping them by month, but that's, yeah, let's go back to the uh, complaint type. So vertical, it depends a bit on the communicative or analytic purpose that you're making the visualization for. Uh, bar charts are good for showing the relative proportion as as well as to some extent the absolute proportion uh here we can see that we actually started at zero so uh this is showing absolute proportion uh another interesting one can be to show the what i don't know what just happened there but i'm going to switch this is not right okay here we go uh Another interesting way to break it down can be a different category. So here in the 311 uh, complaint types, what we saw was that there are uh, tens of categories, so we need to truncate it. Uh, what happens if we choose a dimension with fewer categories? So in this one, I had shown 12 slices and others. There's still another here. Uh, I don't think there is. Yeah. yeah. So in this case, we are actually, oh, nope, there is a tiny little other sliver. But uh, here we are more in the ballpark of 10 than tens. So 
uh, some other visualization might be useful. I still think a smaller number is better. Uh, these are, I, I don't love that it doesn't put the labels close to the uh, chart itself. If I were making a visualization in some other tool, I would actually label the slices where, where appropriate. Uh, but does anyone have a thought of what a uh, pie chart versus a bar chart might be good for? Ooh, yeah. yeah, Tom, that's exactly it. A pie chart shows how much of the whole uh, each category is. But you can see that in the mouse over flyout text that uh, this includes the percentage. And that's because a pie, the whole pie is 100%. So it is good for showing that like fraction of the whole, whereas with the bars, what we were seeing was relative, like something a little more absolute. Uh, if you were to stack all of the bars, which is a different visualization, you could get something a bit like a pie chart. A pie chart is a bit like a stacked uh, bar chart that you kind of roll up on itself. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's that's the task you can that it's better for I, I agree David with, but with with some exception it, I'd say if there's more than like four or five categories it's really hard to tell the to actually intuitively see the difference in size when it, when you start getting little things like this here you can see that these are because they're labeled with the actual quantity I would agree that it's easier to see that difference in a bar chart um yeah yeah, pie, pie charts have a lot of hatred in the data visualization community uh, for various reasons I won't go into here. Uh, if you want to make a pie chart, this tool will let you. <laughs> uh, but the, the, again, the important thing is uh, choose a visualization that actually meets your need. Uh, you have some information satisfaction need. Is it uh, seeing the relative proportion of the whole, is it seeing uh, change over time, and so on and so on. Uh, there's some, here we go, this was back to the pie chart. Uh, I made one last one that I'm not going to do interactively because it's unfortunately a little too slow, uh, but in fact, it seems to be slow to load too. Uh, I made a filter again of my uh community district and i counted up the loud music and party uh complaint types uh and did a heat map a heat map is if you take all of the points on a map that have something that happened and give them a little bit of a blur and then add up the blur uh think like a bell curve or something then what does it come out to it, so you can imagine a bunch of little points actually i can show you that you can imagine a bunch of little points, each of which have some value indicating what the uh, severity, the number, total count in this case is. So you can see that whatever this address is, they had more counts, maybe two or three versus one complaint in the other ones. Uh, and they blend together as you zoom out. So you end up with a map showing what are the hot spots of noise complaints in Manhattan 04? And it's meatpacking and Hell's Kitchen for the most part. And these are probably the vicinity of nightclubs. I didn't compare with other maps, but uh, it's kind of, kind of fun to see that it lets you do these fairly interesting and powerful analytics. Uh, John asks, can you see where the complaint came from? And yeah, you can actually drill down to the data table. Uh, I'm not sure if it specifically lets you, for example, click on one of these. It doesn't look like it, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, if you were to do it in a tool like maybe Cardo or something, uh, then download it and upload it to there, you might be able to do something like that. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it is definitely aggregating to each individual one. You can uh, choose a different visualization, like a bar chart by count, and 
instead of grouping by complaint type, you'd filter by complaint type and group by incident address, for example. That's one way you could do that. Uh, that way you'd see what the hotspots are by address for this category of complaint. So it's, you can answer some pretty interesting questions. Uh, it is, Gloria asks if the data is anonymized on the portal. I want to plug tomorrow's uh, session again uh, on ethics and privacy and open data. It has some really, really like, top-notch speakers, but uh, it is anonymized in that characteristics of the person making the service request are excluded. Uh, it doesn't tell you who is asking for, for service from the city government. It does include some relatively detailed information down to the address. I don't think it includes a, a unit number information for uh, apartment buildings and the like, but that's something you might check in the data dictionary or just by browsing the data set. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's that's the open data portal. As you can see, you can do some fairly uh, interesting. Uh, oh yes, yeah. great great answer, Dimitri. I should have suggested that too. Uh, I'm actually going to go into the edit view just because I think we are okay on time. So <laughs> uh, the way I did that was in the point aggregation for the map view. I selected the map visualization here, location as my column. Uh, I had chosen heat map. If you choose none you'll be able to get information about the, what the heck just happened? Oh, it exploded it so that you could click on each one separately, I guess. Hmm. I, okay, it's it's not doing what I thought it would do, but that's okay. Uh, I, I know there's a way to get it to do what Dimitri said. <laughs> uh, but I'm also gonna move on from here unless anyone has any questions. Do you have questions about what you can do with the uh, portal about 311? <laughs> Look for places that have a lot of heat and hot water complaints and don't go there. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I absolutely should have shown you this. Uh, yes. How do you export data? So going back to this uh, roll up view that I made earlier, uh, what are the top complaints in my community district? complaint types. There's an export tab right next to this tab. You can download it in a variety of formats. That's the, why is this not going away? <laughs> oh, well, uh, I confused it by typing the data in manually, I think. Uh, you can choose a variety of different formats. The bottom half, these are mostly for uh, other programs. CSV or CSV for Excel are good ones to choose. Uh, Does anyone else have questions? Gloria, that was Gloria's question. Okay, yeah, you can absolutely export them. You can open those in uh, programming languages, in analytic tools like Excel or Google Sheets. Tableau, yeah. Actually, I think Tableau lets you connect using the API, uh, in which case you can actually, like with 311 data, have a Tableau dashboard or visualization that gets regularly updated. Ah. Great question too. I did in fact save some of these. Uh, you can see that I had gone to, what happens if I cancel? This is actually something I have saved as three on run 2023 and have no for agency. Uh, to save a visualization, you have to be signed in. Let me find the sign in button. Oh, I've already signed in. Right, I'm looking at my saved visualizations. You can make an account, you can use it almost full featuredly without uh, making an account. The feature you get if you sign in is saving. Um, and yeah, when, oh, in addition to saving, sharing. You can uh, make your visualization uh, available on other sites. You can make it available in the data set search. Remember that data lens we saw before? Stuff like that. I Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, that is the publish button. So uh, yeah, you can save them. And you saw those embed links. Uh, that's under the 
little share button here, you can get something that's suitable for, uh, uh, I think, think, think it includes open graph data, so you can put it on Facebook. Okay, uh, and that's my chair arriving. Apologies for the loud noise. Uh, yeah, okay. Any other questions about the data portal or uh, shall I move on? I'm going to move on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dimitri. Yeah. There. Once you've got those those tables of data, you don't have to just visualize them or filter and roll them up in the uh, data portal. You can export them, like Gloria suggested uh, or asked about, and use them in your own tools. You can do that automatically. You can have them refresh the data every day, things like that, and uh, build tools around them. And yes, join data with other data sets. Actually, come to think of it, one of those really cool tools is BoardStat that uh, Veda NYC makes. Uh, it is a way to break down mostly, I think, the 311 uh, service request data set by community district. So you can see easily what's happening and what's changing in a community district. So, uh, but the Government agencies themselves also make a lot of tools that build on open data, uh, especially things like maps. You can see that uh, I was like I was talking about at the very beginning. And my city map is fantastic. Uh, you can look up addresses. You can look up administrative geographies like community districts and find things like how far is the nearest green space, how far is the nearest green market. A lot of like things that the city provides. Uh, so yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, besides downloading to Excel or Google and uploading to Google Sheets or things like that, uh, I'd mentioned Tableau. You can make, uh, if, if like with programming tools or with like website development tools, you can make other stuff that uh, uh, built on them like these things. Uh, instead of uh, City Map. Uh, NY City Map. I'm going to show you Boundaries Map real quick. It is exactly what it sounds like. It shows you the boundaries of the various kinds of administrative units, administrative geographies in New York City. So, what are some of these? Well, there's community districts. Here's Manhattan 04, like I had been using in all my examples. It's right next to Manhattan 05, which includes most of Times Square uh, and K Town. <laughs> Uh, there are other administrative geographies that you might be interested in. What's my school district? Oops. Or fire district, fire battalion, uh, police precinct, and so on. Uh, as well as political units like council or assembly district, or state senate. Uh, you may be interested in uh, things related to business development, like historic districts or business improvement districts. Uh, there's another tool called uh, Zola, which is uh, from also from the planning department, which uh, this, this tool, by the way, is uh, Beta NYC's uh, from the planning department that shows you uh, like all the uh, zoning uh, on a map and things like that. So, yeah. There's a really fun one from, uh, I think the planning department, yeah, planning department called Population Fact Finder. And what it does is it shows you stuff from the census on a map. So it's like, I often find when I'm walking through a neighborhood, I just wanna know like who lives here? What's the, what's this neighbor? Like what, what changes as I go on a walk? Uh, and one of the ways that changes is like an economic and demographic, uh, it, indicators about the area. One of the things that changes is the zoning of the area and stuff like that. So with Population Fact Finder, you can look at the statistics from like census statistics uh, at a very variety of different uh, granularities. So the smallest one is called a census block. And it's, uh, as you can see in Manhattan, it corresponds roughly to a city block. Those are nested inside tracts, which are considered the smallest unit for statistical analyses. The blocks are more uh, administrative for actually counting people uh, and so on. 
uh, there, these get nested technically, census tracts nest inside counties, which is not as interesting in New York City, but uh, we have some city uh, aggregations as of these called neighborhood and community district tabulation areas. Because the census tract boundaries don't map exactly to zip codes or community district boundaries, which are legislated, uh, we just make up these statistical areas that are, we as the government makes up these uh, areas that are a bit like that. So if I were to pick these two, that's basically Manhattan 04. Uh, or I could just look at Hell's Kitchen, which is what I would do. Uh, you can see here that it, show, it shows you some very, very high level data, population, housing units from the latest census. You can drill down in the view data to actually see some of the uh, demographic statistics like the fact that there's 60, 59,000 people in Hell's Kitchen. Now, I told you this was from the decennial census, the 2020 census. Uh, the Census Bureau used to have a long and short form census and they would randomly send you a long form. Uh, they got rid of that and replaced it with an ongoing yearly survey called the American Community Survey. That gets rolled up at one, three and five year increments uh, which for you, instead of the census's point in time as of what, like April 1st or whatever, it's the, uh, an average over that time frame. And because it's a statistical sample, you have more variability. It's not an actual enumeration. Uh, some of the values are not large enough to have confidence in the, the count. And I really, really love about Population Fact Finder that they make it easy to tell when you shouldn't rely on some data. For example, the, uh, th this, this visualization, by the way, is called the population pyramid. And this is a particularly good one because it shows you a comparison with, in this case, the city as a whole. And it shows you the error bars, the gray here. So if you want to say, is this different than the city as a whole? What you want to see is, is the city within the gray error bars? And uh, like for these, you would say, I don't think I'm confident to say that it's different from the city as a whole. For these, you do the proportion, by the way. Obviously, the counts are different. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Oh, cool. That's, I'm really glad to see that. Yeah. Census data is my actual favorite. Uh, I really love the Census Bureau. <laughs> in fact, I almost took it a fellowship there instead of coming to my current job. Uh, so close, would have been really cool. Um, in fact, I highly recommend everyone do that. If you're actually interested in census data, if you're a techie, look at XD's uh, uh, Emerging Technologies Fellowships. They're just, they're really great books. Um, okay, so those are all the tools I wanted to show you. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of other uh, once. Oh, yes, I want to highlight this. If you go to the Open Data Portal, uh, you can look at the projects there. There's a link. I think it's under Learn More. Uh, the whole gallery of things. Oops, this is going too fast. Uh, like I said, everyone likes to look at restaurant violations. Yep. Uh, and I really hope some of you make your own, expose the data on your own, and have fun with it. Thank you, Kate. Yes, that is, that, that's really good. I, yeah, love the census people. <laughs> okay, yeah, any, anyone have more questions? Thank you, Larry. And I have, don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the extra resources. <laughs> Some water. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate the praise. Always. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad you find it valuable. Seriously. And so I wanted to go on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. And the thing is, it just seems the portal just seems to get better and better with time. Uh, I told you at the very beginning that the data dictionary was updated for uh, three one one data. It actually lists all of the. Descriptors are like the subcategories for complaints uh, by complaint type. So you can actually get like some documentation of what these things mean to some really fine granularity. 
other classes and different aspects of the data. Uh, well, I guess, I guess that's the uh, thing that Kate shared earlier, more classes during Open Data Week. Uh, I personally do not know, unfortunately. But yeah, tomorrow is about uh, privacy and ethics has like Gail Brewer, who was, I guess, the godmother of the open data law. There's uh, uh, two folks from uh, so the surveillance, surveillance Technology Oversight Project, great good governance group, uh, and uh, Adrian Schmoker, who I think was uh, with the city. Yes, Kate, can you unmute Kate, please? The mouse has vanished. Ah, there it is. Can I unmute Kate? Let's try that. No, that didn't work. Hi, oh, great okay. class. Um, yeah, I wanted to just jump in. If you were wondering about Open Data Week, I'm happy to share more, but um, you can check out the program. There's over 60 events happening this week. So some of the um, data sets that were mentioned in class today and some of the tools um, or some of the questions that you have can be answered um, at sessions throughout the week. So highly recommend whether you're looking for like data science education about how to link data sets, or if you're looking to really dig into a topic like housing, um, there's tons of tools and tons of sessions organized by um, community groups, um, government offices, mayor's offices, um, et cetera. And really encourage you to, to use this week to explore this world. It's really fun. Um, and thank you so much for this class. Um, it's It's been great. Oh, does anyone know an answer to JQ's question? Uh, do you know of the other sessions happening during Open Data Week? Are they being will will the recordings be made uh, available online? Like tomorrow? It, I don't know if it varies by session. I don't. I, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, one. But like like Kate mentioned, uh, a lot of like advocacy groups, housing advocacy groups, things like that use this data to uh, do their work. So it's it's kind of like an interface between how the government works and what people need and what we want to advocate for. Uh, like I said, breaking down data, rolling it up by community district can help you make arguments about what your community district needs at community board meetings. So yeah, I think it's in addition to just having fun answering questions, playing with data, this can be a really good tool for communities to empower themselves. Hey, um, just to jump in, we will have recordings. Um, thank you, Kate, for mentioning that again in the chat. Um, we are recording most sessions and they'll be made available to you. Um, there will also be other intro to open data sessions throughout the week. If you'd like to refresh or if you want to introduce to somebody else, we'd love to have you come and check out our program and join more of our sessions. Yeah, don't come to mind tomorrow if you want to meet someone else, uh, see someone else's take on. <laughs> Although it might be different. Yeah, open data dash data.nyc. Such good stuff. Yeah, I love open data week. Also, be sure to check out some of the art. That's one of the like it, 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 it's like a twist on data. We think of data as being like this cold hard facts and things like that. But because it's a data about people is about people, you can actually interact with it, engage with it in a lot of ways. And I think some of those are actually pretty important. Elena asks, how can one become an open data coordinator with NYC? Uh, it's, a, I believe, just a job within any particular agency. Uh, so you'd go through usual civil service, get hired. If you have expertise in uh, data management, I guess that's the... Uh, because it requires a lot of familiarity with the data and work of the agency, I don't know if it'd be easy to get hired directly into such a position, but this is this is all speculation. <laughs> People who work for the government here might to be able to say more uh, authoritatively. Thanks, Tom. Goodbye. Design data through design exhibit. Oh, yes, yes. Hmm. Uh 
Cool. Does anyone have a data set they want to explore or have a different question they want to ask of the do run run data? We have some time left, so I can uh, play if you want. Oh, yeah. Let's see if I can bring that up. I'm actually going to try. And here's my 311 tab. Or let me go back to open data portal. Don't save. Oh, wow, it asks you if you want to save. That's really nice. Some of these can be a little bit of a pain to like construct. So having it offer to save when you're navigating away can be pretty beneficial. Yeah, no problem, then. David. Okay, film. Perfect. Let's see if I can. <laughs> this is the tastier version of all friends. Mm, yeah, it looks promising. Let's see if that's the data set we want. Okay, FD, this is also daily, also pretty popular. Let's see what's in it. Each row is a film permit, and it has 14 columns. It is a docx, data dictionary, word docx. Not you. And import. Uh, where's import? <laughs> OK, maybe not that. just actually bring it up in Word. There we go. So what's in the data set? It had, I think they said 11 columns, which are all these things. Category and subcategory look like they'll be interesting. I want to see if, yeah, I will probably break down by category in that case. That'll be fun. <clears throat> cool. Let's head to the data. Oh, I didn't look at how old it goes. I'm going to switch back. I, I actually want to finish looking at the metadata. This is this is a fun data set. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kate mentions in the chat, Beta NYC's conference next week. That's New York City School of Data. It is probably my favorite open data event, period. <laughs> uh, I've been going every year since like 20 or something, 15 whenever it started, uh, year after that. <laughs> and it, it's just great. Uh, you see people from so many different like groups and everyone's just energized about the power of data to improve our communities. That's just, yeah, it's so good. Okay, so let me, oh, this is the new, uh, yeah, there's also a new interface. I was showing you kind of like, whoops, the classic interface. Uh, just because I'm more familiar with that, I'll switch back. Uh, this is similar. It just, things are in slightly different places. <clears throat> okay, so I said I wanted to add a filter where the uh, category is, I think documentary is what I said. Let's see how they're spelled category, just an initial cap, it looks like. Let's see if that, and this has 1,200 rows, so I don't need to really filter by time unless I wanted to. And there are 68 documentaries. These are shooting permits, oh, different kinds of permits. Those are all in the data dictionary. Okay, I'm actually going to do a visualization. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> Thanks for suggesting the film permits data, Rob. I wanted to see category. Okay, so it looks like we have vastly more television than everything else. It's interesting to see, I don't wonder what theater means in this context. But that's something the data dictionary might answer. Let's see, uh, category. Mm, it doesn't say here, but uh, that might be something we can find in other, like, documentation from the agency that produces the data. Anyway, uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. One thing I haven't shown you before is that this lets you uh, do a hierarchical view. 
So if I say pick subcategory, then what happens is I can click on these categories to drill down and it'll show you the subcategories. I can't read these. There we go. <laughs> so we can see that of the 7,000 odd uh, permits for television, 5,300 of them were for things that episode series uh, on a, things with episodes on cable, 191 for news and so on. And we can go back out. What theater doesn't have subcategories? I remember documentaries doesn't either. Film probably does. Okay, features and shorts. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's some pretty cool features in this. Hey, no problem. I had fun with it too. <laughs> That's going to be one of my new examples. This is uh, my uh, fiance's uncle works in film. He's a grip, so woman television. So this is this is kind of a personal connection. Yeah, like with the with the heat and hot water complaints, a lot of folks in my building have had uh, had those. So it's it it can be close to home. Yeah, uh, one thing that was fun was I had actually made a call for service for I think for animal control or something like that, where uh, I had seen an injured bird, and I was actually able to find my own service request in this data set, which was pretty cool. Ah, spending data. I am 99% sure that that's on the uh, portal. One kind of surprising uh, data set that's on the portal is uh, uh, how much everyone who works for the government is paid in salary and overtime. This is interesting because like, there's this tension between privacy, because it includes like names and identifiers. Uh, oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, that's another thing. You don't. You would want to look for the data here if you're looking for some like provenance, if you're looking for something from a source that's actually the city. But a lot of groups uh, consume this data and make it uh, easier to search, easier to visualize. Super, super. Yeah. And it's Open Data Week. Everyone is showing off their data. <laughs> I bet the planning ones are going to be fun, too. Spending. Yeah, let's let's say spending. Let's see if that finds anything. I mean, we'll find lots of things. Let's see what they are. Agency spending by budget function. Okay. I don't know what the yeah, MR. Ah, management reports. Yeah, this is an example of what I was saying where uh, certain kinds of statistical factual reports are treated as open data. And instead of being like the 311 data, a single data set that gets appended to, they are point in time separate data set releases. <clears throat> oh yeah, and like one uh, journalist I was I had seen working earlier, seen the work of earlier, had joined uh, the civilian complaints review board data with the pay data to see who was still employed, whether they'd been promoted and stuff like that over time. It's, yeah, it's quite, it's a lot of opportunities for journalists and researchers and good government groups and advocacy groups to make their case and try to construct an argument, construct a story narrative about what the data means. And like in that case, joining the data, which uh, you can do in other, other tools can be very powerful for, uh, for that kind of thing. Yeah. All right, and I think we are at time. Yeah, I really appreciate your taking the time to join us today. This is, I, I hope you find uh, open data fun and useful and productive use of the portal. Thanks everyone. Okay, Bye. thank you.